So hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, Chinese Corner with the Confucius Institute at Coventry University. We have a very welcome guest, um, Professor Yue Guo, who you are a professor in battery systems. And today's discussion is going to be about the automotive industry in China in general, but with a focus on your special area of battery systems, electronic vehicles, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Before we begin, a quick word about the Confucius Institute. Um, the Confucius Institute, we are a group within Coventry University and we have a partner institute in Jiangxi University. And our goal is to share Chinese language and culture across our area, which is the West Midlands. To do that, we run Mandarin Chinese classes for all levels and for all ages. And we run cultural experiences for local schools and for anyone who is interested in learning more about the various aspects of Chinese culture. If you have questions or you would like to know more or, in fact, try to collaborate with us, please contact us our email at confuciusinstitute at coventry.ac.uk and follow us on our social medias of Twitter, Insta and Facebook at ConfuciusCovUni. Thank you very much. So with that, with that done, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. Um, let's, let's start. Would you mind introducing yourself to, to begin with? Sure, certainly. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much for having me today. And first of all, I'm really delighted to join this discussion with all of you. Uh, and also a hello to, the, to our audience, either the audience watching online right now or maybe watching the recording later on. Thank you for joining us. And my name is Yue Guo. I'm one of the professor at the Coventry University. I'm based at the center of the Advanced Low Carbon Propulsion Center, which is a part of the FTC, Future Transport and the Cities at the Coventry University. So my focus area of research is around design and the development of the energy storage system by using lithium batteries. So the typical applications are in transport. For example, the passenger vehicles, off-road vehicles, and marine, or even some aerospace applications. So if you do have any questions about the cars, the vehicles, or anything to do with the electrification or hybridization of our transport system in the future, please do let me know. I will do my best to answer. Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic introduction. I'm, I, the, the first thing that jumped out to me into your introduction as a question, I love how you, you, you introduced the energy storage systems, particularly the, the, the lithium lithium batteries. Are there, uh, what other energy storage systems would, are there? Right, so if we <laughs> take the, the vehicle, the automotive as example, there are different types of the vehicle available. So the, 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 the type people are most familiar with are the ones been, in, been used by all of us in, in the society for more than 100 of years. That is a conventional internal combustion engine, the IC engine, either diesel, diesel engine or the petrol engine and it, it burns the, the fossil fuel and the pros that they our environment so that's the reason we're going through the process that we call it hybridization or the electrification which means to be the in the future uh, for the, for our transport so it, it, it it's going to be more environmental friendly and but it also very much depending on where the electricity is going to be generated from because <laughs> even for the very developed country like uk there's still a proportion of our electricity being generated from the conventional source for example the fossil fuels mm -hmm. so so electrification is important to decarbonize our transport sector but also how the electricity is going to be generated is equally important because we have to look at it from the end to end the entire life cycle yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. I want to make it clear: this is I have no specialist knowledge in this area. So a lot of if my questions do appear somewhat simple, that would be because of that. Before we get into too much detail about the the industry, the automotive industry in China, I would like to just ask you a little bit about your background. Um, sure. So, uh, how did you get involved? I know that you are you are lead taking a lead role in uh, a joint research center between the UK and China. And I'm wondering how did you get get become interested in this area and how did you get from obviously get to where you are now as leading leading this group? How 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 far would you like me to go back? <laughs> probably not from my nursery time. <laughs> that's, that's not the first time, but, but from a prof professional let's, let's start with the professional professional yes, okay. How did you I mean I'm were you is this a were were you interested in in 
cars specifically? Were you interested in the elect electricity earlier on? What what brought you into this 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 field? Sure. Uh, if we are not too limited with our time available, I will probably start from my my first degree of why I am into automotive or into cars. So I I am very much interested in like a building car models since I was a kid. So mm -hmm. I did my first degree in China at the university called Harbin Institute of Technology, which is in the very uh, north north east part of China. So yeah. very cold place. It easily temperature easily reach minus twenty thirty degrees in winter. So mm -hmm. I spent four years over there. I studied my first degree in the subject of electronics and electrical engineering and automation. Followed by the completion of my first degree, I came to the UK to study for my master degree at Nottingham University in the subject of the computer science. And well, I was doing my master, I started looking for my topic for doing a PhD because I always wanted to do a PhD. I want to spend more time doing the research. So trying to figure out how things work has always been my passion. It's just like what I into vehicles, what, how, how the vehicle runs, why there are four wheels, uh, what are the difference between the different type of the engines. And, and also I'm very, in, very much into the motor sports as well. So mm. during that searching process, I, I, it came into my attention that Warwick University has got a lot of collaboration with their industrial collaborator, for example, Jack Land Rover. So I applied to multiple universities for my PhD degree, but in the end, I select Warwick to form a further for my PhD research. Uh, I came to, to War University of Warwick in 2005, and I did my PhD in the subject of automotive electronics and electrical system design and development. So I spent four years working with my academic supervisor, engineers from uh, from university and also from uh, and also from Jaguar and Rover, and on a very on a very fantastic project. And followed by my PhD study, I stayed at Warwick and I carried on working with my colleagues on a number of the projects, all focusing on the automotive related projects. Uh, the few key ones which are more relevant to the discussion today are around the design and the development of the future transportation and also the future vehicles. So I think the, the electric vehicle, as some of people may know, been existing in the society or, or, or in this world for many, many years. So it is actually a older vehicle type com compared with IC engine vehicle. It has existed for much long, well, for a little longer time actually, but it only becoming a popular topic or the option in recent years as people becoming more and more environmentally conscious and also the, the, the running out of the fossil fuel becoming uh, the, the, the focus of our att attention. For, for people who know about like a Chinese language or Chinese culture or been speaking to people from China, you may know in many occasions, we are, we are even changing, changing the words when we encourage people. So usually when you're trying to, when you're having a conversation with somebody or during the competition or during the event, you say, oh, come on, man, you can, you can do it. So the direct translation into, into Chinese language is yeah. jiayu. Job, you probably know this. <laughs> yes. So that's, you can do it, man. Come on, that's jiayu, jiayu. So that literally means add petrol. So jiayu, you means petrol. But in these days, in many occasions, people no longer saying jiayu. People simply just say, Jia dian. Dian means electricity. So people say Jia dian, Jia dian. <laughs> Especially for some of the like the new uh, mm -hmm. new energy companies or the startup vehicle companies. So people say Jia dian, that means add electricity. <laughs> fantastic. I've not I had not heard that one, but that does make a lot of sense. Jia dian. Yeah, so in the future, yeah. if you hear people say Jia dian instead of saying Jia yu, you know what that means. <laughs> it means go, go, go. That's yeah. fantastic. So Obviously, you've come from a very academic background, but that 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 academia and that research, you've you've found very practical application with this. So, um, what you could you then speak to the this um this EV one hundred and the the joint act joint automotive innovation center, which which they have set up, which I, you are very well in, very highly involved with. Yeah. Uh even since my previous role at Warwick, and I have got, I got in contact with China EV100. And EV100, in a very simple way to describe it, it is a 
highest profile organization of this type in China. Uh, we could describe it as a think tank equivalent to the think tank in the UK. It advised the, the Chinese government on the policy and the regulation on the technology road mapping for the vehicle development in the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the Coventry University, since I joined FTC in my current role, I have been promoting the collaboration between UK and China, not only on the educational program, but also on the collaborative or the joint research. Where, for example, at the Coventry, we have multiple fantastic research centers. A lot of our research outcome have a huge potential to be commercialized and for them, for us to work, be working with the industry, not only the UK, but also the companies in Europe and also in China, for those research outcomes to be commercialized into the actual service or the products can benefit the consumer, the customers on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, China EV100 made a proposal officially to the, uh, the former Prime Minister, Theresa May. It was back in 2018. Mm -hmm. And that proposal was encouraged and supported by the UK government bodies, for example, the SMMT and also the DIT. So it was put on the official agenda in, in 2019, and the Joint Automotive Innovation Center, JEIC, was formally established. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to share uh, good news with you guys. That mm -hmm. At the Coventry University, we are very honored to be chosen to host the JAIC UK office at our university. So in January 2020, 2021, next year, the coming January, we will officially open up the UK-China Joint Automotive Innovation Center UK office based at the Coventry University. So in terms of location, it will, it will sit on the on the seventh floor of the Ferris House, which is the headquarters of the FTC. So we will be inviting the university leadership team and also the relevant people in the industry to attend our opening ceremony, but probably going to be an online event in the consideration of the of the COVID. <laughs> yes, no, that everything, I think, unfortunately, it seems everything we have to do, even, even these talks will have to stay online, but there, there, there are some some benefits. So, when we when you look at JAIC, are there any 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 sort of specific things that you are you are working towards with that at the moment? That are there any sort of collaborations that are, you are able to share with us about the, about what you know or ideas or, or or things that you are projects that you are working towards? Or is that something that is still quite in the in the bit too early to discuss? Um. Well, some of the projects we're, we are planning, it's probably slightly early to discuss, but what I'd like to share with you is uh, the few streams we have planned. So for example, the first one is on the educational program. So China EV100 being the, the most high profile organization of this type in China, it has the responsibility to promote the new knowledge, a new technology that making people aware what is going on, what is the future coming. So it organized the training program for professionals, for academics, and also for, for engineers. And at the Coventry, as people know, we have a fantastic research delivery, both in country, but also overseas. So I'm looking to make use of our existing material, existing, China, existing channel, and working with EV100 even closer on this platform, as in JIC, and making, making people, more people know about our educational offering and also some of these tra trainings which has been delivered by EV100 in China could be co-developed and joint, jointly delivered by the academics or our lecturers at the Coventry University. Because some of the latest research at the Coventry are still not very well known on the global scale. So I'd like to make use of this platform as a good opportunity to raise the profile of Coventry University, raise our teaching capability. So that's the first one on the collaboration on the teaching program. And also we are talking about establishing a joint research center, but probably to start with, it will be like a, in the form of the office in China to promote our research capability. So there are streams in the UK, funded by the UK government, where we can promote or looking for means and ways to commercialize our research outcome. But to facilitate such mechanisms overseas, 
requires additional resource, requires consideration, for example, in IP terms and also in collaborative like T's and the C's, and also whether we, sh we, 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 sh we, we which model we're going through. Is it going to be a joint venture or are we just simply doing that through the licensing scheme? So those are the things we need to take into consideration and to be handled very carefully. Uh, EV100 and the JIC has a very good platform and also a very good experience in handling all those type of activities. So leveraging on their platform, we can help our academics or help, help our research centers to promote these type of activities. Yeah. Excellent. I think it's great, as you, it's, it's very interesting to highlight the, the difficulties or the, let's say, the challenges when no doubt the research is, we all, we all, as academics, we would look at research without borders. We would look at research as the, the pursuit of knowledge, but when that would become into realistic projects, when you're having, having to deal with IP, having to deal with law, having to deal with, with um, potential um, profit sharing companies, I think that's... Um, it, it's a, it will be interesting to see how that develops, no doubt. Um, is there, I'm, I'm curious, when you mentioned working in China, obviously I spent quite, quite a while in Chongqing, which is a very, very industrial city, and that is also known as very, very central for the automotive um, industry in China. Are there any cities or areas in China where you would be hoping or looking at to set up uh, an office with the EV100? Right. Uh, there are a few cities currently on the on the short list, and we we we're actually collecting information in the in the stage of collecting information and also trying to have a very good understanding about what the support can be provided by the local government, for example, financially, or or and also to policy regulation wise. So once the the choice has been made, we will certainly be more than happy to share that that decision with everybody. But at the moment, we are still in the stage of trying to making the select collecting all all the information and in order to make. Our selection. Yes. <laughs> As people That's know, it. we already established quite a few offices in China, for example, mm -hmm. in Hangzhou, in Guangzhou, yeah. in Chongqing, and those offices have been primarily playing the role for the educational program collaboration, for example, working with universities in China on our like two plus two or three plus one mm -hmm. programs. But we are expanding and also we are going to set up the new office, either based on the existing setup or creating a new office at a, at a new location in order to play the role to facilitate and promote the research collaboration. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing this. We will have to um, come back another time to, to when we have when we have more details of this to discuss. But I think it looks like a fantastic, um, there's plant certainly fantastic potential and that's certainly I know that that will provide some opportunities for for students at Coventry University to become. I know that we've 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 collaborated in a very small way before with um, with Geely to try to link students to to potential projects. And yeah. I say the with Confucius Institute, we can we can offer some language support and some cultural awareness. Obviously, that's a, a small amount that we could do, but yeah. this sort um, of this sort of collaboration that you're setting up is is I think. It's a great way to look at the education and support for students. So I hope that's something that will be able to continue. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And also on the note of the, the, the working with Gilly, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to you, George, and also other colleagues who've been kindly supporting the last student competition in summer. So for people who didn't know that at Coventry University, we officially uh, sponsored or, or or supported Gili on, the, on this year's Gili Campus Innovation Competition, which is open to all the students at the university from undergraduate to postgraduate, including a doctor student. So uh, there are, as a brief summary, I think there are 10 or 11 students from Coventry participated either as an individual or as a small group, up to three people. They have gone through a number of the competitions have gone through all the full selection process from the initial competition to the semi-final to final. And the good news is a group of our students, they went, they, they managed to get to the final round and they actually won the third place. Fantastic, congratulations to them. Yeah. Excellent, excellent result. 
And um, also the, the Kung Fu Institute played a very important role. And also Joe and also your, your colleagues provided a lot of, lot of support in helping those students who's in the competition to, to revise and enhance their slides and their, 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 their presentation and also helping them to better understand the Chinese culture in order to highlight their, their project advantages in the best possible way. So it, it was really important. Okay, thank you. I think that's that that's a, an area that we, we we certainly want to be looking more into and do more more in this this understanding and awareness of the cultural again presenting information to a to a different culture people with different cultural backgrounds in a way that would work best for for the for the the win win or the, the the highest result. Yeah. But I'd like to sorry I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna oh, sorry, <laughs> before no you keep praising us. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Your, most all the work was very much from, from your, your side for the, the students. But I'd like, let's go back. And I think one of the major topics we were looking at is the automotive industry in general in China. Yeah. And I think I wanted to start in one of the specific to, to your area of, of battery systems, um, electronic vehicles. And the, the thing that stuck out with me, I, I moved to China in 2006. Um, I, first, I first moved to China for, for work. And the thing that had surprised me was the uh, was the sheer amount of electrical bicycles, uh, electronic motorbikes, or you know hybrid bicycles with with pedals and and um, batteries. Because before then, the only only places I've seen electrical bicycles were on Tomorrow's World, which was a, a sort of science fiction or science um, the future science program. But when on arriving in China, they were everywhere. There were people that was just how people got around it wasn't a new thing it wasn't surprising for me coming from the uk what something we think of as a developed country or, or certainly is a more developed country officially but when i arrived in china and not in beijing or shanghai or a central city it's a city called taiyuan in shanxi province which is a third tier city and everyone has an electronic bicycle motorbike i had one it was great fun and <laughs> Not only that, but the, the it, there was set up, there were infrastructure, so shopping malls, workplaces would have spaces in front of them that you would you could park your bicycle and someone would plug it in and charge it for you. Yeah. And I wanted to, to look at, in that context, I mean, how did that happen in China? Why, why was China so far ahead of, of, of having electronic vehicles? Perhaps at that stage, not necessarily electronic cars, but the, the the battery systems were were clearly being applied in in for transport. So how did that happen, and and why do you think China was sort of more advanced towards, or more more accepting? Right, uh, I think uh, probably first of all, uh, China as a market, it's I would say it's driven very heavily by the government policy regulations. So the Chinese government has rolled out a very I would say very ambitious plan about how, how as a country, at the country level, how the decarbonization will be implemented in the, in the coming decades. So that including the transportation sector, but also in many other industries. And for, for Chinese industry, the battery manufacturing and also the EV manufacturing is a very important part. So in terms of the numbers, you, you may probably familiar of back, going back to, to the bicycle you, you, you mentioned earlier, you probably, mm -hmm familiar with the term, they, they say it's like a China is a kingdom of bikes. <laughs> uh, in nowadays, we probably, we could slightly revise that term to the, the kingdom of electric bikes. <laughs> and also, as a matter of fact, China is the largest market in terms of the EV production and also the utilization. It has the largest number of EVs in the whole world as a single country. Yeah. And automotive industry plays a very important part in, in, in China. And the Chinese government is looking for new initiatives and new ways in order to promote the technology development and also the, the better returns in the investment. So as a whole world getting hybridized electrified, there are a large number of the central government and the local government policy and also the supporting mechanisms being, being put in place to promote the technology development. And I'm, I'm interested in this as well. When I mentioned Taiyuan, the, the, the city of Taiwan, it's, I've, I've double checked that it's 2018, they became, I think the first, I believe the first city in China, quite pros, probably the world to have every, their entire taxi fleet um, changed to battery vehicles, um, um, electronic vehicles. And that's, that was a sort of example of a hugely ambitious local government proposal. So 
why do you think that China has chosen to invest in this in, in, such, a, in such a way? And, and why, why do you think that's different from a US, UK? Why, why is China perhaps more forward looking this way? Right. Um, China has been developing its own automotive industry for decades. And if I'm being like, a, quite frankly speaking, for the conventional IC engine vehicle, China has made huge progress in terms of the technology development or advancing, but still note, I wouldn't say it's in a leadership position. And in the new new world of the electrified, the new electrified world, Chinese, China's ambition is to, to play in catch up and also potentially taking, taking the lead position on, on the electrification of the vehicles. So there have been many like different voices in China. For example, some of the people say we should spend our resource or all our attention or effort focusing on the development of the EV and the EV only. Let's jump ahead. Let's skip the hybridized vehicle, because as people know, uh, hybridization hybridized vehicle has the two sides of the system working in parallel. That's both that includes both the conventional IC engine and also. The, the electric machine and also the energy storage system, typically a lithium ion battery pack. So people mm -hmm. say, well, if we continue spending the resource and effort on the hybridized vehicle, uh, we're probably not going to play catch up very quickly. It will take longer for us to be in the leader position for the electrified vehicles. So how about we forget about the hybridized vehicle? Let's spend all our resource energy focusing on the development of the EV related technology. Mm -hmm. it, it was the major, I would say, the major voices in the last few years. Mm -hmm. In recent years, there have been different opinions. And also, China has actually just rolled out the latest technology roadmap in the last few months. Mm -hmm. In the latest technology roadmap, there's uh, the focus of the hybridization of the hybrid, hybrid vehicle technology. Mm -hmm. I, from a personal perspective, I mean, on this particular point, I can only express my personal view, but my yeah. personal view is, it is actually becoming more realistic in terms of the technology development. So EV offers many advantages comparing with a conventional IC engine vehicle. But in terms of the massive production and adoption, we still have a quite long journey to go. Still a journey we have to travel. There are still the issues we have to resolve. Mm -hmm. Before we can get there, since we are looking to phase out the conventional IC engine vehicle, we need something in between. We need a transition technology. I think hybridized vehicle is a very good, like a transition technology. It will continue playing a very important role, either in China or on a global scale for the years to come. So mm -hmm. in the latest technology roadmap, there's a highlight of the hybridization instead of just focusing on, on, on the EV. I think that's the latest change in this particular market. So I do have a, a, another question there that I related to when we talk about electronic vehicles and hybridization, because something that's been coming to my mind when driving, obviously we when when we think of electronic vehicles, the, our first thought goes towards cars yeah. because we see them. And I think certainly my own focus in China was in the cities. But as soon as we start going outside of the cities, when we go onto the highways and we start seeing more haulage, the, the larger vehicles, the coaches, um, most, there was so much coach and bus travel. There's a lot of, again, lorry haulage. So how, do, how can that aspect, is that aspect being, being developed? Certainly I think haulage, I've seen electronic buses in, inside in cities. Mm -hmm. However, when we look at haulage, especially in, you know, we see farm, farm vehicles, we look at um, lorries going along the highway. What's the future for, for this area? And is that distinct or is that separate from cars? Right, I think you, you raised a really, really good point. Because as a matter of fact, no single vehicle tap in terms of the technology or the power of, of its powertrain will fulfill all the different applications. So yeah. there are particular side of requirement for the city applications, but also there is a different side of the requirement for the applications of the people using those type of the vehicles in the rural area. So mm -hmm. the, the, some, some, some of the company people may say even is a future, 
but for the very long time, EV probably won't have the capability or the advantages to fulfill all the different types of the requirements, mm -hmm. to fulfill all the requirements. Yeah. So if you're talking about the city application, the hybrid probably the best way going forward, either buses or the small city car, mm -hmm. but for the rural area, because of the infrastructure, charging infrastructure required, charging the fully electrified vehicle is still not going to be that convenient in rural area as in city. So the plug-in hybrid or even uh, some other vehicle type probably will have the advantage compared with the fully electrified vehicle. Mm -hmm. And also it depending on how, how the country or the local authority mm -hmm. will spend the resource in developing the charge infrastructure will determine how soon we can adopt yeah. a fully electrified vehicle in those rural areas. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm curious, if you're purely out of curiosity, I think from the academic world and the research world, it's, I, 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 I have the feeling or the assumption that electronic cars are more attractive to research than electronic lorries mm. or EV for lorries. Is that true? Is, do you see? Um, I would say from the research perspective, they, they have loads of similarities. The mm. differences are in their particular parameters or the requirements needed mm. of different vehicle types. For example, for the low race, it requires much higher capacity. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the aerospace application or the, for example, electrified airplanes, they, mm. they need a higher energy density because you don't want to carry the same weight as in, in, in aerospace, as in, on, on the land vehicle. But mm. for the static, and the storage application, I still need a battery pack, but mm -hmm. it has lower requirement in, I would say, in the in the safety side, and mm -hmm. but, but higher requirement on the cost perspective. So yeah. from the R and D perspective, there are loads of the loads of the similarities in between of them, but there are sp a special requirement in their particular applications. I think it's and once we start to look into this area, I think it's fascinating because when it's Certainly, purely from my perspective, electronic cars show up much, much more than any other kind of electronic vehicle. I, I, I can't, I can't even imagine an electronic airplane at the moment. I think that <laughs> feels feels wrong in many ways. But. There, there are actually some very, very good applications in in the niche. I would say in niche market or particular specific market. Uh, please correct me if any audience be following up this type of news. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I, I actually heard this on the news. The shortest air journey in the UK is somewhere in Scotland. It mm. is literally between five to six minutes. So basically the airplane take off from one island and then will travel through the air in five to six minutes duration journey and the land on the other side of the land. Mm. This type of the journey are required frequently during the day, this type of the journey can be easily electrified or by, by using the electrified airplane. But mm -hmm. for the long haul journey, for example, international flight, I think we are <laughs> still quite far away from that. <laughs> yeah, but no, that, that again, this is a, a great the great point. It does matter how, how long, and I'm, I'm sure that that must be correct up in Scotland. I've, you, the, the getting between island, island hoppers must be Yes, but then we get back to the whole the same in, in this, this. I'm sure we get back to the same issue of infrastructure for electronic yeah, um, yeah. vehicles and, and charging. Which brings yeah. me on to this interesting question. I think that the top one of the topics, the central topics, went before we discussed this was was the future of the electric car in the UK and the and the potential and and as and how how can we what would you see as be the best ways to to try to develop an infrastructure for that because i've i've read and i've heard discussions with wind power and offshore wind farms and and i think but then as if i were to to have an electronic vehicle i would need a, a new charging port in my house to do that and if everyone corrects that starts connecting electronic vehicles to their to their house would us i don't think us i'm not entirely sure our system would cope so yeah. what what do you think can be done what do you think will be done right that's a really good question which means it's quite difficult to answer <laughs> <laughs> well um, yes right how how should i approach it let me have a think mm -hmm. 
I think that 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 highlights probably the the point like I mentioned earlier. There are different vehicle types, and also those different vehicle types they will coexist in the near future, and also for a very long period of time. So EVs have its advantage, but hybrid either a mild hybrid or plug-in hybrid or different vehicle types, they all have their unique feature, and each of them will have a role to play. The only differences are how long they have that role play. It varies from country to country, from the, the region to region. So for example, in China, the hybrid vehicle may exist for a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. It will, will trans, tra, tra, go through the transition period, moving mm -hmm. on to the electrified transportation quicker. But maybe in comparison to China, in the UK, we may be seeing the, the role of the hybridized vehicle, or, or perhaps in, the, in being used by the customer in the UK for, for longer period of time, because we may need a longer time to develop our charging infrastructure or, or to, to develop or, or to really have enhance our local local grid. Yeah. And but also there is a there is a like a focus on the development of the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle as well. So there's mm -hmm. another another vehicle type. Uh, yeah. Some people say hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is not going to play a huge role for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I I would say I agree and I disagree. Mm -hmm. One, if I pick up if I pick that up as example in the UK context, hydrogen fuel cell vehicle will require the infrastructure development. For example, the liquid hydrogen storage and the mm -hmm. fueling, etc., etc. So similar as the petrol petrol station. But we, we need a huge amount of the investment to develop that infrastructure before we can roll out the, fuel, uh, the, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Yeah. In the UK, from the conversation I had with the people's expert in this area, they say we have the technology available. However, the UK market is relatively small if we compare that to China. So mm -hmm. we, we, it's very difficult to, to, to roll out that technology and also to make sense in, econ in economy terms. So we have to have a certain number of the vehicles traveling on the road using this infrastructure. Then it, it, it makes economic sense to make that investment. But in China, the argument is easier to have because the number of the vehicle might be required is, is a lot larger. So it's easier for the government to make that, that investment, to make that decision, to make that investment. But in the UK, do, do, should we make that investment? How many vehicles we are going to have on, on a road that being used by the by the people? Is it really worth doing that from the technology development point of view? Is it really worth doing that from the economy point of view? So those are the arguments we need to have. That's that's yeah. You raise up obviously many very very clear points, and I uh, obviously I I've, I've not thought too much about the hydrogen fuel cell, but I've certainly seen that on on Top Gear and other things, and I've seen recently. I know that in well, three. There's the example of James May, who who has one a hydrogen and a, a, a hydrogen vehicle and a, an electronic battery vehicle, and has some YouTube channel to to compare the two. But yeah. I, I think that's not that's a that's a small area. <laughs> and we've just had had a, had a had a comment from John Carter okay. saying, surely the infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cell will be even more difficult to achieve yeah. with the safety issues over hydrogen use and storage. And um, yes, of course. I, Yes, thinking of the Hindenburg as the the, the very famous yeah. example of that. So yeah, John is absolutely right. In, in in fact, in the UK and also at the College University, we have fantastic research facility and also research team been developing the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but the company hasn't been growing very rapidly compared with those type of the companies in other countries. For example, the ones in China purely mm -hmm. because of the size of the market. So when they're having a the conversation with a local authority to say, would you like to try out the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle? They will say, okay, we may we may adopt five or 10 as a small fleet, but uh, associated the cost to building that local infrastructure is huge. So yeah. if we average that out, if you were to have a hundred or even a thousand vehicle, that seems like a very small piece of cake. But if you only have five or 10 vehicles as a small fleet, then that's a huge cost. You, you have to buy ways to put in that infrastructure before you uh, you can you can actually uh, enable these vehicles to travel on the road. And I think with to, to this the question of safety for for hydrogen is hydrogen more uh, volatile or, or more dangerous than the petrol we already use? 
Uh, it, it could be more dangerous than the than the fossil fuel, but if it, if it is handled properly with all the safety infrastructure in place for storage, transportation, and also all the necessary safety features incorporated on the vehicle, it doesn't have to be more dangerous than the conventional IC engine vehicle. Okay, thank you. I do want to, um, perhaps we're talking a lot about the, the, the battery vehicles, and I wanted to, to touch on some criticism I think we've that we've seen in the past about battery vehicles um, of are they clean is this a clean technology well that when they're running certainly they're clean but is the production of uh, and development of lithium and the transport so there has been certainly in the past um, uh, criticism of the the the, the cr creation and storage and disposal of batteries potentially being worse than buying a, a, a conventional car which which you can you know a second hand or a, an, an older car which you can simply continue to use so yes. is that an issue will that be an issue when we come to disposing uh, of, of the lithium batteries once they deplete um, what's your take on that that. Right. My, my short answer is it is an issue. It is a very important issue we have to take into consideration when we're talking about electrification of the automotive or the transport sector. Uh, the, for example, the EV, electrified vehicle, fully electrified vehicle, a, a, a can be clean, but it's not necessarily clean, especially when we're looking at the entire life cycle from the production to disposal. So if we focus on the battery used on the electrified vehicle, the mining process is not actually clean. And also the manufacturing process for those lithium batteries are not quite clean compared with some other industries. So for example, all our conventional IC engine vehicle has like a 12, 12 volt ladder as a battery, usually fitted underneath your, 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 your bonnet. Mm. For the for the lead acid battery, for people living in Coventry, you probably know there's a recycling center very close to, to the ring road. You can mm. actually take your lead acid bat batteries over there. There's a dedicated like a space. You just drop off the battery over there. Somebody, a specialist will come over, pick them up, get them recycled. Uh, they, those lead acid batteries can be recycled more than 95%, typically 97, 98%, the lead and also the liquid and even the plastic casing can, can be recycled and reused almost completely. But when we're talking about lithium ion batteries used on the electrified vehicles, it is very difficult to reuse and then recycle those batteries, either as an entire energy storage system or when we're breaking them up or disassemble them as a, disassemble them as an individual cell or break them into the into the pieces as a material. We still don't have a fully established business model to do the second life reuse or the recycling. There are mechanisms or other solutions available, but at the moment only available in the laboratory environment. Mm -hmm. If we really want to roll that out and to introduce that on a massive scale, it has to make sense from the economy term. But mm -hmm. because of the cost of the capital investment and also the actual cost of that process, it still doesn't make economy sense. Hence, there's no established business model as how the, 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 the people or all the vehicle manufacturers, the OEMs, can effectively reuse those automotive batteries as a second life or fully recycle those materials. So it is a very important consideration. And also that's only from the manufacturing process point of view. Back to what we mentioned earlier, even when you are driving the vehicle, when you're charging the vehicle, depending on how the electricity is generated or where it's generated from, it's not necessarily 100% clean. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's very, again, an interesting thing. And Hopefully, through your, this can be something that your research group, such as yours, could be looking oh, into. Certainly, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight at the Cold University, we also have a dedicated group doing the research on the remanufacturing of automotive battery, automotive battery packs. So, we're looking for means and ways to effectively reuse the end of life automotive battery pack. We're trying to sustain their lifespan by finding a second life application. And after that, we're looking for means and ways to break them into pieces and to recycle those materials effectively. Fantastic. And hopefully that can be, as I say, that will be the, the as, as EVs become more, more and more, more used, then that will be, perhaps isn't an issue quite yet, but is an issue that will be coming in if several in, in the years to come. Yeah. Um, I think, we're coming, we've got about 10 more minutes. And I think the last of my, 
and I've, that's a fantastic, I've, I've very much enjoyed this, the chat so far and um, thank you for the questions. If, if any more questions, please, now is the time to get them in. I did want to touch on the, the B word um, that I think we sent out before. So one of the questions um, was asking, I think the general topic that I, we, we discussed was saying is about the, the current state of the automotive industry in China. And how do you think that would relate to the automotive industry in the UK post Brexit? Obviously, we're not clear about what will happen come January the 1st. <laughs> we, do know, we do know that we do see that there are, um, we've, we've, the Japanese car companies will be finding it more difficult to export the, the cars that are being made in the UK yeah. and perhaps being, being less. How will how how do you see our the, the relationship between automotive in China and UK developing in the future? I think is the question. Right. Uh, from a personal perspective, I think one thing for sure is there is a large scope for collaboration in technology development, especially for EV between UK between the UK and China. And also that is one of the reasons we're setting up this joint automotive innovation center because mm -hmm. communication it's not always very easy, especially everything moving on to online. We have to have a good understanding, have the technology, having the culture in order to find the best possible alignment between the two countries, between the companies. Mm -hmm. And there are certain technology, for example, hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, if we only looking to develop that technology in the UK, then obviously the market is not going to be as large as if we were to develop that technology together with some other countries like China. Mm -hmm. So if we can bring the people together, looking at the bigger picture, some of the technology we are developing in the UK will have a huge potential, not only within the country, but overseas, like in China, we can fully exploit that technology. So all the cost which may looking quite high, but if we're taking as a much larger market into consideration, then those capital investment, those R&D costs can be fully and easily justified. But we need to have that confidence. There are customers, not only, bless you, <laughs> not only in the I UK. I had unmuted so people wouldn't notice. <laughs> <All right. laughs> So we have to be confident that there are customers, not only in the UK, but also overseas, for example, in China, who like to be working with us to ex exploit, to develop that, that, that products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, there is certainly going to be, uh, uh, certainly based on your, your joint, your research, the, the connections that um, car company, you know, Chinese companies such as Geely are building in the UK. Um, I think there's definitely going to be an interesting, interesting future. I think it's. I think that's as, as much as we, we can say. It's going to be, going to be very interesting. So, I think we have covered a lot today, and we could certainly cover a lot more. Um, my, I think that the, the final question for I have for you, I think about battery systems, about automotive cars, um, is in the current market, in the current. Um, marketplace of, of, of vehicles what if you had without without monetary considerations what would you drive uh are we talking about the the first week or the second week or? <laughs> ah that's the question you 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 answer the question how you see fit <laughs> right okay for if i were to purchase my second vehicle I think that will be a full, fully electrified vehicle. So, so BEV in, in technical terms. So fu fully electrified vehicle for mm -hmm. sure. Because I, I live very close to, to, I live very close to, to town center, not too far away. So my typical like, commuting journey will be under 10 miles. So mm -hmm. that's, that can be well covered by the, by, by the typical EV. It doesn't even have to be like the, the most superior vehicle with a very, very long journey available. Mm -hmm. And my, my usual, like a weekend journey, for example, taking my kids to a local park or to going to the shopping center uh, can also be easily covered by the typical EV in terms of the range. So, so I don't really have to have a, like a plug vehicle to give me like that, that insurance I possibly need when traveling over the very long journey. Mm -hmm. And if I were to buy 
the vehicle of, 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 the, of, the, of, of that vehicle is the only vehicle in my family, I probably would go for a plug-in hybrid, the PHEV. So mm -hmm. for most of my journey can be covered by the pure EV, EV miles, the EV range. And if I do need to travel over the extended distance of journey over the vehicle, for example, going over to Lake District or, or the Peak District for hiking, then I, I, can, I, I can use my IC engine on the vehicle available. Mm -hmm. But uh, the factor I probably have to take into consideration is the cost, because the, the, the hybridized vehicle, the EV, still more expensive comparing with the conventional IC engine vehicle. Even mm -hmm. you take into all the manufacturer subsidies and the government schemes or government subsidies into account, it's still slightly more expensive. Mm -hmm. When I purchased my last vehicle, I compared the same vehicle, but in two different powertrains, the PHEV and the, the diesel powertrain. Mm -hmm. I have to put my hands up to be honest to say I chose diesel in the end because the, the hybridized powertrain was literally 7,000 pounds more expensive. Well, so yeah. I worked out, I have to own that vehicle, carry on driving based on my, uh, based on my mileage for more than five years to reach the breaking, breaking even point. Mm -hmm. That's that. That is, I think, uh, a similar issue we have. I uh, certainly, I've early on in the lockdown, we I, I got rid of our larger car, <laughs> we sold that one, and we have not replaced it. So this is sort of very much an, an issue that we're looking at at the minute. We, I think, my wife and I have a have a similar approach that it would be very useful to have. We would be attractive to have an electronic vehicle to go to work. I mean, yeah. in the Coventry University car parks, there are charging bays, so it would not yeah. be an issue. For my wife's workplace, there are charging bays, so we would. For, for, a, for a daily daily commuter, that would be no issue, but the price is mm. currently somewhat yeah. prohibitive. Yes, yes. Despite, despite that. Hopefully that's yes, something- consumer, We'll have to do our calculations. <laughs> yes, yeah, these, these are the things, and hopefully that would be, I mean, and that is definitely a consideration. That's can't, you know, for, for, for political, politically, if there is political will to, for people to to ad adapt, then there needs to be subsidization. It needs to be affordable for for the yeah. vast majority, yeah. and I think that's uh, something that needs to be certainly looked at. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are sub as you say, there are subsidies, but these are not. They still put them outside the outside the the um the reach of of the the majority. I mean, so um, hopefully we'll, we shall see what happens. And and. On that, on that thing, do you do you feel? Sorry, I think we're almost coming to a new topic, but I do want to go into this. How do you think that electronic vehicles will um, will cope in a second-hand market? Will as as I don't. How do batteries? I understand that battery storage um, decays over time yes. and becomes less useful. So how will they? So currently, I've I've, I've not. I've always bought second-hand. How would that cope with? How would that with that? Will that be possible with electronic vehicles, or will that be worthwhile? That is an excellent question, George. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask some question. We have three minutes left, but right. <laughs> I think my simple answer is for for I would say for the residue in terms of residue value, mm -hmm. there's a lot more uncertainty around a hybridized or electrified vehicle compared with the conventional IC engine vehicle. People just don't really know, don't have the confidence about how much value they're going to return after have using that vehicle for a few years. And it is a reason sometimes putting people off from buying them new. Mm -hmm. And compared with the consumer electronics, like a mobile phone, when you buy the new one, you know next year your phone will be devalued by maybe by 30, 40% when the, when the next generation coming out. But yeah. you wouldn't mind, you get used to that. And also in terms of total value, that's no more than a thousand or even a few a few hundred pounds. You probably don't 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 mind it that much. But in terms of the vehicle, you can easily spend ten or hundreds times of the more money from your own pocket. So that's easily thirty thousand pounds to be spent. If that vehicle going to devalue that much or devalue much quicker comparing with the conventional IC engine vehicle, you're probably a little bit more reluctant to buying them new. And also mm -hmm. when you're buying the second hand, depending on the current diagnostic technology how well you would know the, the current status of that vehicle. Is it still in the top condition or in the average condition or in the not so good condition? How would you be able to know compared with the IC engine vehicle? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to tell at the moment. 
And also that's why we're also developing some rapid diagnostics technology at the college university <laughs> help our customer help our industry to do the very quick diagnostic to help you to tell is it still in a good condition average condition or not so good condition so you can make your decision is a lot easier i think that that's right the last thing you want to do is to get a bargain on a, on an electronic vehicle and then have to replace the the batteries Exactly, exactly. Be... The ba batteries is the most expensive single component on the electrified vehicle, for sure. Absolutely. Well, I think that is all of the time we have. I do appreciate you taking taking this time out of your day to discuss. And I think it's a it's a fascinating um, topic. And I, it is a, when we it is something that we are that is very, very specific to people as we do use cars and use vehicles every day. And they, they impact our lives so much from our personal transportation from mm. the the online deliveries that we're all getting now through lockdown to uh the food in our food in the supermarkets from our trade with with our closest partners all is being done by by vehicles and there will be no doubt be change in in the future and it's very good to see that coventry university particularly have have a very forward looking view on not just the the, the, the basic overview but the various aspects recycling um um, clean dis disposal and and as you said diagnostic and maintenance over over the years that's very forward looking and um, thank you very much for sharing all of that with us it's been a pleasure thank you again for inviting me i really enjoyed our discussion great me too and I, I i will make sure we share all of this thank you to everyone for attending and for everyone who's watched and we will hopefully see you in future sessions thank you thank you to all the audience thank you for your participation hope to see you again in the future thank you bye-bye Bye-bye.